welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very informative show coming right up with special guest Katie Novak. And Katie's here today to talk to us about her new book, Let Them Thrive, a playbook for helping your child succeed in school and in life. Now, Katie is an internationally renowned education consultant, as well as a practicing leader in education as an assistant superintendent at a school district in Massachusetts. With over 15 years of experience in teaching and administration, she earned a doctorate degree in curriculum and teaching. So let's welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. What a pleasure it is to have you here. And gosh, your book is pretty impactful. You probably are getting such great response from people saying we've been needing this for some time. Well, you know, it's it's so interesting because as a as a teacher and a lifetime educator, I've always had the opportunity to see the teacher's side of things. And, you know, just how hard everybody's working and, you know, the professional development, you know, everything we're trying to do to impact the lives of kids. And now that I'm a mom, I also get to really experience the parent side of things by talking to my friends. And there is some sort of disconnect, I think, when you think about, you know, uh, parents and teachers and what we're trying to do for kids. And, And the more that I'm spending time with everybody, I'm realizing that we're really all trying to do the same thing. You know, every single person is trying to provide the best life they can for these kids. And so, you know, I've written a lot for um, teachers trying to say, you know, understand what parents are going through. And so this is kind of my first foray into saying, you know, parents, this is what we're dealing with as educators. And, you know, this is what teachers are up against. And if you join forces with teachers, imagine the impact that we could make on kids. Well, and so I have to ask you, you know, what, I mean, because you've got this great background, being a mother, being a teacher, and having um, just this, you know, huge background in education. How was it that you got started on this path of bringing all this together and developing Let Them Thrive? You know, I really started thinking about what does it take to impact kids. And a couple of times in the past few years, I've gone to conferences and people have asked, you know, how do you get parents on board with this? Because what I what I talk about for education is called universal design for learning, and it's really about personalized education for students and giving students choices about you know what they're going to learn and how they're going to learn it and how they're going to share what they know, and it's it's really an innovative approach to teaching and learning. And so when dealing with teachers, sometimes they'll say, "Oh my gosh, I absolutely love this idea." You know, I'm worried about how parents are going to react to this. You know, what are parents going to say when I start to say, you know, students can choose how they want to learn this and what they're going to do. And, you know, it's not going to be so predictable anymore. And so in my own school district where I'm the assistant superintendent, you know, I started thinking about, gosh, like, how do we get parents on board? And they have just been absolutely open and hungry for information and really excited to see that what we're doing is going to help prepare their kids better for the future. And so, okay, so that's actually a great, um, a great way to kind of pivot to my next question here, because kids are so diverse. How is it that the education system, the school system, can get behind children and start teaching them different styles of motivating them to, to learn better? You know, the, the really amazing thing right now is that everybody is in the corner of universal design for learning. So like this is what is hot right now. This is what is endorsed throughout public policy. And so really if it's not happening, it should be more surprising. And so, you know, the really interesting thing is to think about what the standards actually say. And so, you know, as a mom, I'll be looking, you know, on social media and people will say, oh, I, you know, I I hate this common core math or, you know, it's this new math. And the really interesting thing is, is there's, there's literally no such thing as common core math. There's no math problems in the common core standards. You know, all it is is what are the outcomes. And so, for example, one of the outcomes starting when kids are really little is that kids will use more than one way to solve a problem. 
And so that is the only thing that the standard is really dictating. And so you think about how much freedom you have to say to students, you know, what are all the different ways that you can use to solve this problem? And what materials do you need? And what resources do you need? And, and do you want to work together? Or, you know, what other creative ways can you think of to accomplish this problem? And, you know, it really provides all students with an opportunity to, to really go down a road to take a path and to end up at uh, the same destination when they all took different paths. And so, you know, for parents sometimes when they're frustrated with, oh, my gosh, look at this homework problem, you know, what they're actually looking at is, is a company, which is a for-profit entity, um, a company's interpretation of that standard. And, you know, what, what's really empowering is all of the standards actually endorse this concept of UDL, which is really a framework for personalized learning. And so the book kind of explains, you know, that, that teachers are kind of up against sometimes these curriculum adoptions where districts are saying, you know, this is the curriculum you're going to use, when in fact there's many other journeys that they could take to get students to the same destination. And so, you know, knowing that this is what is, you know, written into federal legislation, you know, I want to empower parents to fight for it, to say, you know, if, if your kids are struggling or if they're bored, um, there is nothing wrong with your kids. Students are not disabled. It's our schools that are disabled. And, and having that, that mind shift is so critically important for our babies. I'm so glad that you brought that up because, I mean, it seems like over, I mean, since when I went to school, there's definitely been a shift and looking at how kids learn and how we classify them as well. And some of the some of these tags that the education system or parents or well-meaning teachers, wherever, labels children with can be very harmful for them in, you know, in their later years. Absolutely. And the interesting thing is, is, is what are we really preparing them for? And so for a really long time, like when you and I went to school, it, we were really focused on the acquisition of knowledge. Like how do we know things and bring them on, you know, to further generations? And, you know, what's really interesting is, is now, you know, Siri and Alexa and Google do that. And so this concept that everybody just needs to be this receptacle of knowledge is really archaic. You know, what students need is to know how to be learners. We need students to know how to set goals and to solve problems and to be creative. And every student is capable of that. And maybe those kids aren't going to be, you know, traditional, quote, unquote, good students and that maybe their recall is not going to be, you know, as impressive as another student's recall. Um, but that doesn't matter because we always are going to have these tools at our fingertips and therefore we should allow students to use those, you know, every single day in what they're doing as they, you know, really are empowered to think about their own passions and their own strengths and to create a journey for themselves that is different from the journey that we used to set forth. Because again, you know, if you're looking at, you know, I would like to hire someone who is going to do exactly what I asked them to do in a very predictable way, then I'm going to hire a robot. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, and thank goodness they're, they're making such transformations because I know parts, for me when I was in high school, parts of it were brutal, you know, and I, it was just like, gosh, I'm just, having a, a hard time and struggling. It's like math was not my thing. So it's it's so interesting that there, you know, there's some recognition here and some changes are being made. Yes, and, it, and it's so incredibly exciting. You know, I get to walk through classrooms every single day from pre-K to 12th grade and to see what is happening in classrooms and to see how kids are enjoying themselves and getting to be creative, there's something that's so incredibly empowering about that. And so last week, for example, I went to a high school history class. And when I think back to my high school history classes, it was very much like we sat and listened, you know, for, for hours at a time <laughs> sat and listened to our teacher who would explain things and who would like talk about what was in the textbook. And, you know, that was basically the magic behind how we were successful. We had to remember what he said. We had to take really good notes. 
and then that was it. And, you know, looking forward now is I walked in and the teacher basically said, okay, I need all of you to know these important things about the opium war. And so you decide how you want to learn them. So a group can come over here with me and I'll kind of break it down for you. You can look it up online. You can look in the book. It's totally up to you how you want to learn it. And then here's the rubric I'm going to use. So you decide how you're going to show me what you know on this rubric. And so some kids did speeches and some did PowerPoints. And when I went in, there was a group that did a sock puppet rap battle. And it was like <laughs> the most unbelievable. They're the sweetest little things. They were like setting up tables and they all these cute little socks on their hands. And they actually pulled it off because they were students who probably like getting up and rapping, you know, it might've been a little bit too much to stand in front of the class, but they had these tables in front of them. And it was like one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And to think like, you know, what would we have done 20 years ago is we would have required everyone to read the same chapter in a textbook or to listen to a teacher's explanation. And then everyone would have taken a test and then that was it. And it's like, well, how useful are those skills really? Because in my own life, I don't ever have to take a test. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and what we really need are more people who can be creative thinkers, like how you're explaining these kids are doing this rap song, you know, for part of their work, you know, their schoolwork there. And it was amazing because that, like, wasn't even a choice <laughs> given by the teacher. <laughs> you know, it was it was really like, you tell me how you want to do it. And, like, off the top of their heads, they're like, yeah, sock puppet rap battle. Like, that would never be on my top 20 of ways that I would, you know, prepare information. Um, but even seeing my own kids, you know, who are, you know, I have a, an 8-year-old, twin 7-year-olds, and a 3-year-old. And, like, just seeing the work that they come home with and how they're allowed to make it their own and to know that, you know, this is what we are, are calling for teachers to do. And, you know, if, if parents are perceived to be a barrier, a really easy way is to find out, you know, what is the best thing for our kids and how can we help usher them into this next generation? And then to kind of say to teachers, like, listen, let us help you with this. Like, we want to be here by your side as you, like, basically blow the doors off of what education has looked like for the last century, you know, and to, to increase engagement. And, and that's the biggest thing is, you know, when we talk about this concept of universal design, it really comes from architecture. And, you know, Ron Mace, who is this architect back in the 80s, said, you know, if there is somebody, for example, in a wheelchair who can't get into a building, the building is architecturally disabled. You know, we can't say that a person is disabled because disability is really contextual. So, you know, you know, in a classroom, I, I might not be someone who, you know, is going to fill that that the um, label, I guess you could say, of, of being disabled in a classroom. But if you put me on the top of a, a double black diamond ski slope, I am very significantly disabled in that environment. And so we talk about, you know, universal design for learning is saying that if your kids are not learning, the schools are actually disabling. Um, and there's two reasons why our kids don't learn. And, and one of them is access. They literally can't access the information. But the other is engagement, which means that it's just not interesting or relevant or authentic. And so, you know, for parents out there who have students who, you know, can, can do pretty well, you know, they understand how to kind of play that compliant school game, the question is, do they love what they're doing? Do they love learning? Are they filled with a sense of wonder? You know, are they creative and motivated and self-directed? You know, and if they're not, we would say that school is disabling for those students as well because we want to set them up for a life, not that they're compliant and that they can, you know, follow directions, but they are inspired to do something bigger. They're inspired to kind of find their own meaning of success. And that requires them to become a learner, you know, somebody who can look at all the resources available and all the strategies available and, and pick the ones that play for their own individual strengths and that will get them closest to where they want to be. But also we want to arm them with the, the knowledge that anything worth achieving is not super easy. And so what are all the skills that they need to overcome obstacles and barriers? And, you know, I love the lens of the institution. And to say, you know, today I was looking at my baby sleeping. He was taking a nap. And I was just thinking, 
gosh, like I want the world for him. And, you know, I know that every parent looks at their child and thinks the same thing. You know, I want the world for this kid. You know, and how dare schools get in the way of that? Oh, yeah. I would agree with you on that. And it's because there's there's so – each of these children have, are so gifted in their own right. You know, it, it's um, interesting for a school to say, well, you're gifted, you have issues. You know, it, it – they're all gifted. They all have the ability to learn and do well. Absolutely, absolutely do. And, you know, as a teacher, I never met a kid that I didn't see some, like, spark of brilliance in. And, you know, maybe they weren't the strongest reader, but they, you know, were so charismatic or so musically gifted or just had such a way about understanding themselves. And, you know, I would always say to parents, these kids will be fine. They will do well. They will move mountains. Like we just have to get out of their way. And, you know, I think for too long, American education has gotten in kids' ways by creating this institution that if you didn't follow and assimilate, you know, in this one way, then then you weren't thought to be successful. And, you know, what's really interesting is, I don't know if you've heard of the book, um, Karen Arnold and Eric Barker recently wrote a book um, that really focused on what happens to valedictorians. And, you know, I would say, you know, as a parent and also as myself, this made me really excited because it, it looked at if we were doing school well, like if this was the, the institution that worked, then valedictorians would be far and above more successful than everyone else because they have, you know, effectively played the game of school the best. And so they found 700 valedictorians and, and they created kind of all of these different measures of like, what does it mean to be successful? And, you know, obviously it's not only monetary, but it's like, how many people do you affect? Um, you know, how many other people's lives do you change? And then how happy are you? Are you doing what you want to do? And so they found all of these valedictorians and, and kind of asked the, the question. And the outcome was that zero of them, zero out of the 700 really felt as though they were the success story that they wanted. And so the author said, okay, maybe that's just human nature. Maybe, you know, people just are never satisfied. And so like, let's look a little bit deeper at this. And so then they went and found like 700 millionaires, you know, people who own nonprofit organizations, you know, and your Mark Zuckerbergs and your Warren Buffett. And, you know, they, they did the same thing. And these people are saying, yes, like, I am living the life I want to live, and I'm very happy. And their average college GPA was a 2.9, you know, which is in most places, you, you can't even stay in your major if you're not a 3.0. And <laughs> yeah. it this really important book to say, hey, like, there's something here that says that we don't measure passion and drive. Um, you know, the way that we're supposed to. And, and one of the takeaways of that work was that so often valedictorians just feel like they have to fit into a system that they're really unwilling to shake it up, you know, and that those of us, myself included, I was not a student, um, you know, I, I never felt like there was only one way to do things because I never felt like I was really successful that way. So I've kind of had to find my own way, and, and that has allowed me to live this beautiful life that I'm, I'm happy every day and blessed every day to wake up and live, you know, which is to teach teachers and to change education, not only for my kids, but, like, for everybody's kids. Well, and so is that what the definition of success is today, then, is that the students are defining it for themselves? Absolutely. And and I think that it's always actually been that way. And I think we're just for the first time recognizing that, you know, as adults that, you know, I always say to people who I have friends who are really, really worried about how their kids are doing. And my kids are little. So, you know, most of my friends' kids are really little. And I hear things like, oh, my gosh, you know, what second grade teacher should I request? And I'm like, Okay, <laughs> let's just step back, you know, let's think about what do you really, really want for your kids? Because I don't want a transcript of all A's. I want kids who are nice to each other. I want kids who work hard, you know, and I want kids who can look back when they're adults and say, this is a life I'm proud of living. And when we can change that lens and say, you know, there is not only one way to be successful, 
we start to open up possibilities for every single child to be successful, not just those who arrive to school ready to learn and be compliant and do things in a more traditional way. Yeah. I, I think that that's so fabulous. And I know you also talk about there's lots of research that's been done on just how how children think, how students think, and how this affects their brain. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and UDL um, or universal design is really based on like 30 years of, of research into what happens in the brain. And, you know, one really neat thing is that, you know, brains are wildly variable or different from each other. And even though there's like patterns in that variability, in order for anyone to learn, you know, basically they have to know why they're learning, they have to know what they're learning, and they have to know how are they going to use that information. And so you think of any child ever who walks into a classroom and, you know, they're going to say, well, why are we doing this? Like, that's a very good human mm -hmm. question. And if educators don't have a really great answer for that, then do something else. Because we need to say, this is why this is important. And when we realize what the why is most of the time, we realize that the one size fits all way of doing things is not going to be super effective because, you know, one thing, for example, that, that a lot of students will fuss over is like, why are we all reading this book? And what's really interesting is none of our national standards require a single text. So there is literally nothing that students have to read. And it's really up to educators and schools to determine how to get students to understand how to comprehend text and how to understand themes, and therefore, you could really have students read anything and still meet all of the standards. And, you know, to, to step back and to say, you know, my son, um, Torin, who's in third grade, the other day, we went to the library, and I'm like, hey, buddy, look at this book. And he's like, mom, reading's not my thing. Now, I was an English teacher and am, like, in love with books. So I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I just got punched in the stomach. And I said, what do you mean reading isn't your thing, buddy? I said, you, like, love sports. You love Sports Illustrated. He goes, oh, I like to read nonfiction, but that's not reading. And I was like, whoa, 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 you know, let's back up, cowboy. I said, you know, that's very much reading. Let's go look at the, the sports books. And then he was, like, all into it. And so that's his entry point. And so, therefore, when he's at school, his third grade teacher is amazing about, well, what do you want to read? What do you want to write about? And it all started with sports. Like, that was kind of where he entered. And then she was able to kind of push him a little further, like, oh, you know, I see that you're doing all this work on the Patriots. Um, you know, do you know that there's statisticians who, who work on that? And we could do math based on that, you know. And, and so now he's like, Mom, do you know that, like, there's people who, like, they grow up and just do math on sports? And, you know, so how much cooler is that than, like, a worksheet? where you're just filling out math problems over and over again. But, you know, you said that, you know, math wasn't really, you know, totally your back, but guess what? You have a calculator and you're fine. <laughs> so I, I, you know what? I do. I, I, you know, it's so funny because I'm so good at using Excel spreadsheets. I mean, I yes. actually rock those. But back in the day, it's like, you know, trying to do algebra. I'm like, oh, I can't do this. <laughs> you know? right. I went to a conference recently and they said, if you're giving tests, that if given the access to Google and an Excel spreadsheet, the student should ace, it is a complete waste of your time. And I'm like, ooh, I love that. <laughs> because again, I love that too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, why are we asking students to do that? And, you know, and again, there is absolutely nothing wrong with understanding of how math works and the art of reading. But the, the reality is, is if some students can't access it in that way, you know, so if you have a student who is visually impaired or you have a student who, you know, has um, dyslexia or, you know, some sort of print disability, or if you have a student who has really weak recall, for example, then, then reading a book is not going to be the best way to reach them. And therefore, that book becomes a barrier. And with digital technology, you can say, okay, well, why was I even assigning the book? That comes down to the why. You know, our brains need to know why. And so, you know, I'm like, well, I, I really want them to interact with ideas and to understand that ideas have power and that you can question them and that you can look them up and verify them. Okay. So I could do that with um, a movie or an audio book or a regular book. And as, as a professional now, 
I, oh gosh, like it, it pains me to say the last time I picked up a hard copy of a book and read it. Um, because most of the time I am listening to it while I'm driving or I'm reading it on my phone, you know, and so why do students not have the same opportunity to do what we do as professionals and just to think how much more in love with learning would they be if that was truly an option every day to say, you know, the standard is, is that you understand how to interact with ideas. And so you choose something that you want to interact with. You know, it could be a news article. It could be, you know, something happening um, in the world. It could be, you know, a book that you like. It could be an athlete that you like. You know, pull something up that you're passionate about, and then I can work with that with you. Um, and, And seeing teachers do this well, like a lot of people say, gosh, like, what does that even look like? Um, and, and let them thrive talks a little bit about what that looks like and what assessments might look like and how a classroom will change. And then also it provides, um, teachers with, uh, parents with, with language to start approaching school boards and, and principals and teachers to say, you know, this is really where the future is at with education. And not only is this the best thing for kids because they're enjoying themselves and they're creative and they're problem solvers, but this is actually now endorsed in every single level of federal legislation, which obviously, you know, um, parents are not super privy to education law oftentimes, but the standards, Mm -hmm. the Higher Education Opportunity Act, if you have kids in college, the um, the Every Student Succeeds Act, if you have kids pre-K to 12, like this is is the the foundation on which all education decisions need to be built. And, you know, parents have the potential to change that very, very quickly. Um, You know, I love, love working with our school board in my district. And, you know, they're so impassioned and excited to learn about, you know, okay, tell me why this is good for kids. Tell me what it is and then tell us how to do it. What do you need us to do? And it goes back to the same things we need for students' brains, is if we can answer why and what and how, we get people who are purposeful and motivated and resourceful and self-directed. And we don't have people who will just be compliant and get through 12 years, you know, answering questions and filling in bubbles, um, because where does that really land them? I mean, a kid only gets one chance at second grade and fifth grade and and 10th grade, and we should give them the best opportunity to be successful in their life in every single one of those grades because they don't get that back. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Katie Novak, author of Let Them Thrive, a playbook for helping your child succeed in school and in life. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com 
There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. So we're here today with Katie Novak, who's sharing with us her new book, Let Them Thrive, a playbook for helping your child succeed in school and in life. So, you know, I know you talk about also in your book, gosh, it's just filled with so much information. You talk about students being able to express knowledge in some way. And I'd love for you to kind of just share with us. I know we've been talking about that already, but I'd love for you to share a little bit about that for us. Because I think a lot of times, you know, families may be a little um, not sure how to look at the knowledge that their children have and, and teachers as well, not really being able to like assess, like, hey, you know, where can this person learn and shine the best? You know, I think it really comes down to to coming back to that why, which is like, what mm-hmm. actually is the goal? And so, you know, when parents are are familiar with the standards to say, for example, let's say that, you know, students in a science class really have to understand the process of photosynthesis. You know, why is that important? You know, because you have to understand that we're in this symbiotic relationship with plants, um, you know, understanding just kind of this life cycle and what allows humans to thrive biologically, that's an important thing. And so, you know, the first thing is, well, why is that important? And so saying to students, you know, okay, so let's first talk about why it's really, really important to know this. So we take care of our planet, so we understand and the importance of food and greens, you know, and let's talk about also, you know, what are some of the dangers, therefore, of things like, you know, deforestation. So we start with the why. And then we say, you know, ultimately, what you need to know is that, you know, the, the process of photosynthesis, you know, it's not so important that you understand all the vocab necessarily, but just how do plants allow us to stay alive. And so there's a lot of different ways you can learn this. Um, there's some really good articles that you could read. There's some really cool videos you could watch. I'm happy to explain it to you. But we're going to sit and you're going to think about, like, create a personalized learning plan, which is how do you think you could learn this best? And, you know, here's your menu or here's your buffet of options. And if you have a better idea, let me know. But ultimately, you're going to choose, like, how do you want to learn? You know, what do you think you'd like to do? Do you want to work with a partner? You know, do you love books? Do you love videos? So on and so forth. And then to get to your question, it's, well, how are you going to show me that you actually met that original why, which is the ability to explain what the process of photosynthesis is. And again, my my why is not that you learn all the vocabulary, because in all honesty, as an adult, I don't remember all of the words for every part of the plant. So I would say, you know, Mm -hmm. one option or choice you have is to use this vocabulary sheet. And, you know, these are the words that you may want to use. Um, Also, here's an exemplar of what, you know, I wrote just so you can see, you know, that I I like writing. And so I wrote it this way. Um, But also you decide what's best for you. So do you want to record a video? Um, Do you want to present in front of the class? If maybe that's a barrier for you, do you want to record audio? Because I could teach you how to make a podcast. Um, Do you want to just come over here and tell me? Do you want to create a children's book? Like, again, you think about what the best way is for you because the, the only real requirement for me as a teacher is that you understand this concept and that you're able to explain it in your own way. And so, you know, what you'll realize there is there's going to be some choices or options that are not going to allow a student to explain it. So, for example, you could have a student who draws a picture of, like, a plant cell. That's not explaining how it works, you know, unless there's a pretty significant diagram and labeling and things like that. And so as a teacher, you know, if I had a student who said, you know, I would really like to draw a picture, I would say, okay, so I'm struggling with how you're going to explain to me how it works with a picture. Are you going to write words? Do you want to explain it to me with words? I can describe it if you want to tell me, but like, how are we going to get there? Because I need to know that you understand why this is important. And it's 
basically that cycle over and over. And, you know, I like to use an analogy of a dinner party to say, like, imagine that I called you tonight and I'm like, Marion, I'm coming over. I'm bringing 10 guests. You don't know any of them. Okay. As a, a host, you would automatically just start thinking of barriers. You'd start going, oh, my goodness, like, I wonder if any of her friends, you know, um, maybe they don't eat meat. Um, maybe some people are on a diet. Um, I'm going to have to have a lot of options. And that comes really natural to us as guests. Uh, we ex- kind of expect if I get invited to your house, I'll be able to eat something. And, you know, what's really interesting is, is back in the 1970s, people just really put out a casserole. Like my meme used to make like a mean pot roast, but when she invited you over, that is what you were eating. Like it was not a question <laughs> of if you ate meat. It was like you're eating burnt pot roast in a pressure cooker every Sunday night whether you like it or not. And <laughs> we don't casserole teach anymore, and we don't casserole serve dinner because if you had a party and you didn't know which guests were coming, you would not just go for the casserole. You know, you really start thinking yeah. about – how can I make something like a salad bar or a pasta bar or like a deconstructed taco thing so everybody can have options and choices because individually, like we're all going to need different things to really feel full and to feel like satiated and to feel happy about being at your house. And so, you know, I always say that traditional education is kind of like casserole teaching, whereas everybody gets the same thing on their plate. And, again, it, it just doesn't work because you can't really give me a compelling argument as to why I have to eat that pot roast <laughs> because your why for inviting me over. Well, in this scenario, I invited myself. But for your why for mm-hmm. inviting me over would be I want you to eat a plate of food. I want you to have a good time, and I want us to have time to, like, connect. And, you know, teaching at its core is emotional work. And how can teachers – get the time they need to actually connect with students and to have those really important conversations, you know, that say, you know, I I understand that you want to do it this way, but I'm struggling with how to help you do that. You know, you can't do that when you're, when you're up in front of the classroom talking for an hour. And so this idea of moving from casserole teaching to a buffet is really what personalized learning is, is that your child, whether he or she is three or 25 you know, is able to see a buffet of options and is really empowered to make a plate, you know, to say, what is it that you need to eat in order to feel like you're like really a part of this party? And, you know, that is what inclusive education is, is that every single child has a right to be educated with their peers in an environment that challenges and supports them. And that is, you know, a belief in in equity and social justice. And we have to fight for that so every single child has the opportunity to be really wildly successful in his or her own way. Mm, I love that. I love that. And, and so then it brings me to my own next question for you is, you know, why is failure a gift? Why is, you know, when we fall down, why is that something that would be considered a gift in this circumstance? Well, I think failure is the best teacher because if I go to your house and I say, you know what, you know what, those uh, those figs look really good. I'm going to eat an entire bowl of figs, and then I'm sick for a week. I now know figs are not the best choice for me, <laughs> and like that's a lesson that I experience. And it's the same thing with students. If our goal is we want them to learn how to be learners. Um, We're preparing these levies for jobs that don't even exist yet. So this concept of, like, we need them to be open to, okay, this is my goal. Um, Here's all the resources I have available. Here's all the strategies I know about. I have all these opportunities to collaborate. How do I get to the goal? And what you realize is that success is a really, really messy, messy road of, of a lot of, like, learning from failure. And so, you know, you'd say to a student, okay, what is the best way for you to learn this? And let's say that you have a, a little lovey who's like, huh, I don't, I'm just going to say reading because my best friend chose reading. And then when mm-hmm. it comes time to give this presentation, this, this child has no idea, you know, how to explain what they read. You know, that's something really empowering about that self-assessment to say, okay, like I really liked working with my friend, but that wasn't a really great way for me to learn. And so next time I probably shouldn't pick that. 
and or I should, you know, either not pick that or to create a better strategy to do that. And so, you know, this concept, I bet you most parents have heard of this concept of like personalized learning. You know, and, and that's essentially this buffet concept that, you know, students are given options and choices and then are given the opportunity to choose, you know, again, how they're going to learn, how they're going to share what they know within the confines of those standards. And, you know, what we, what really great UDL practitioners do is they focus just as much on reflecting on choices as making those choices Um, because it's all about, well, this was my personalized learning plan. This is, you know, what I chose for the resources. This was I chose for the strategy. And then looking back on it, it was, well, how does your input relate to your output? And so did you make effective choices? Did this allow you to be really successful? Um, you know, when, when I was in that history class that I was telling you about where there was the rap, uh, the sock puppet rap battle, um, there were, mm-hmm. uh, there was a group of girls who actually tried to do an interpretive dance and they, she's like, are you sure you want to do it? And they're like, yes, we can like change the music based on it and we can have it almost like poetic, like up on slides and we can share like, you know, the, you know, the biggest, um, the biggest point of view from like the British side and the Chinese um, nationalist side. And then we'll like create this dance. And so she's like, okay. And after like three days, they're like, this is not going to work. You know, we, we, we can't pull it off. Can we change it? Absolutely. You can change it, you know, because the, uh, the idea was amazing and we're so glad that you took the risk, but the more they thought about it, the more they said, this is not the best way to kind of meet this task at this time. And I think there's something amazing in that because, again, I've tried things professionally that haven't landed that well, and and what do I have to do is I have to adapt and reflect and – you know, again, that, that is a gift in of itself. And, you know, one other really big part, um, you know, if you were to Google right now, personalized learning, the two words that would come up the most often are voice and choice. And so we've talked a lot about choice, you know, is we provide options for students for how they're going to learn, how they're going to share what they know. You know, uh, we, we give them options for really thinking about why this is important. But then this, where does this voice part comes in? And this comes from, I really need to understand what my learners need so I can create the right options on the buffet. So, you know, when you were, you know, when I'm saying, hey, I'm coming over with 10 friends, you would be a lot better off for your planning if you were to say, you know, well, what kind of food do you like? (laughs) Or, you know, (laughs) did I go with a certain theme? And and that's voice. And so saying to, to students, you know, at the end of every assignment, how did I do here as a teacher? And, you know, what choices were allowed you to be really successful and what choices do you wish that you had that you didn't, you know, for example, like working together or bringing in your own device. And then you just, your buffet can get bigger and bigger as you're empowered with these, these other voices. And so, you know, as a, an assistant superintendent and a professional development provider, you know, I work with teachers all the time and my goal is to help them understand why UDL is important what it is, and then how you start implementing it in your classroom. And I'll take big risks sometimes, you know, go big or go home, and I'll try some things. And every time there's a break, so normally about four times, you know, during a a, a day-long presentation, I'll stop and I'll say, okay, I need to know how engaged you are right now. I want you to think about everything I'm doing and all the options and choices that you have right now. And then you're going to tell me, like, how am I doing with giving you options for engagement? So, you know, do you feel like the things that I'm offering you are relevant and authentic and meaningful? You know, are there options to work together? You know, are there coping options like having breaks and snacks and things like that? Um, And then no matter how you think I fare, I want you to tell me one thing I could have done better. And the the magic of this statement is to always start with, it would be cool if, because I learned the hard way from teaching seventh grade for a very long time. I was with seventh graders for a decade. Um, if you just say, tell me how I'm doing, you better have very thick skin when you're talking to 13-year-olds <laughs> because they'll tell you how you're doing. <laughs> and so I would always say, okay, l- lovely, tell me how I'm doing, but say it would be cool if, and they'd be like, you know, it would be really cool if you didn't go through the explanations in such detail. You know, it would be really cool if one of the options was to sit with you and go through it because we could have figured it out on our own. Um, and, and really, that's a micro failure. 
You know, I have failed them in some way. And I still do it professionally every time. And we're talking hundreds and hundreds of presentations. And I will always get feedback I have never gotten before, which shows that there is no ceiling on what it means to be successful. And if you don't open yourself up to allowing other people to say, you know, what could I do better for you? You know, how could I create a better learning experience for you? You know, you can look at that in one of two ways. You can look at that as I failed, or you can look at that as an amazing opportunity to be better. And like that concept of expert learning is what we want to instill in our students is, you know, when you reflect on the, the personalized plan that you created for yourself and, and you're really willing to say, you know what, I messed up here, or the teacher made a really good point about what I should do next time. You can look at that as failure, or you can look at it and say, wow, I have a whole lifetime now to make better decisions and to try out the strategy, and like, uh, like there is no stopping me if you can pick kernels and diamonds like that every single day. And so that concept of what does it mean to thrive, it is a child who learns how to be motivated, who learns how to set goals, and who sees learning as really a vehicle to be successful. You know, it, and we're not talking about successful on a test, you know, or successful on a transcript, but to say, wow, this, this thing that I am required to do for a minimum of 12 years of my life will actually allow me to live the next 60 the way I want to live it. Like that is a privilege and a gift that many people in this world would give anything to have. And we need to, to really wrap that up as the present it is, you know, to allow students to see that. Well, and I love how you make it so, um, so that, you know, the students are included. There's this, you know, it's like this community. They've got collaboration going on. So all these new ideas are breeding as they're being able to go ahead and, and finish a project or, you know, choose the way they wish to learn. And I, I love how you're bringing that more forward. Yeah, and, and again, like, you know, all I, all I am right now is one of the messengers because this is out there. You know, what I would love for every parent and teacher to know is when I present to teachers, you know, all over the world, I have never, ever met a single teacher ever who wasn't doing the best they knew how to with what they had. Oh, you know, yeah. teachers, they, they, they really, they create, they, they create this life for themselves because they, they love kids, they love learning. And if they're missing the mark, if they're not there yet, it's because they don't know how. Or, again, we go back to, like, I'm like a broken record on this. They don't know why the change is important for kids. They don't know what universal design for learning is, which, again, is this framework that provides a set of principles, you know, that says you have to provide multiple means of engagement. You know, you have to put out options to get students engaged. You have to provide multiple means of representation, which is a multiple ways for students to learn, you know, whether it's going to be text or video or audio, and then multiple means of expression, which is we have to give students opportunities to share what they know in unique ways. And to do that, we also have to do the same thing for our teachers. And, you know, the, the real privilege that parents have here is to focus on teacher professional development. And, you know, if we believe so much in the power of learning to transform opportunities, then we have to invest in our teachers better. Because, you know, you have these teachers who are in these pockets who are saying, okay, this is the way that I was taught to teach, and I have these principals who are telling me to do this, and so, you know, I'm going to do it because I want these kids to be successful. You know, and there's just so much research now that, you know, that's a, a really great way to um, deposit information into students who are, I guess you could say, neurotypical or who arrive ready to learn. And that number of students gets smaller and smaller and smaller as our world becomes, like, more inclusive and diverse. And there was a, a research that was done um, in 2010, and they basically asked a bunch of students to say, you know, how, um, how interested are you in school? And something really depressing, like 80% of students said that they were bored in school. And then when they asked them why, you know, 80% were felt it was the subject being taught. And it was like, oh, my gosh. Like, again, if you think about all the different countries all over the world who are fighting for education, for free public education, mm -hmm. and we have it, and people are saying, gosh, this is a waste of my time. This is so boring. It's because we're, we're doing it wrong. And, you know, so to say to, to teachers, like, there is another way. 
And, like, please, please, once I make an argument as to why this is so important for kids, why this is important for you, you know, here's a million different ways you can learn what it is. You know, you can read books. You can listen to podcasts. You can go to conferences. Um, you know, you do, do book studies. Observe other teachers that are doing it really well on the teaching channel. And, you know, when we provide all these options and then support them with how, we end up seeing classrooms that are transformed. And, you know, that's, it's, a, it's a symbiotic relationship because when parents understand why, you know, this one-size-fits-all packet is not going to meet the needs of kids, they can then go on behalf of a school board and say, our teachers need better professional development. This is a requirement right now. It is endorsed in the standards that you're requiring teachers to teach. It is endorsed in the federal legislation that provides funding for our schools. We need to fight so our teachers know why this is important and know how to do it because that's the way that you can change a system. You know, if we rely on individual teachers to learn about it on their own, we're just going to have these random acts of improvement or teachers who, you know, are really empowered and understand how to do it. And, and that's great because they they're ready for it. But what about the teachers who haven't heard of it yet or who aren't supported by their systems? And, I mean, it is public education, which means every single person, you know, listening to this, every person in this country actually has a say in how we do it. And when you learn, you know, that there is a framework that is there, is there for the taking to say our students deserve a personalized education that allows all of them to use their individual strengths and to be empowered to be creative, self-directed problem solvers, you know, where they can say, this is the best thing for me, and then make a mistake and say, you know what, awesome, I learned that that was not the best thing for me. You know, when we can create a system that is just, really about how do we create a community of learners as opposed to a classroom of automatons who can get 30 of 30 on a multiple choice test and then go on to be competing with robots who could do that much quicker. You know, what are we really setting them up for? And, you know, as a mom, you know, I know that, like, I see my kids loving and enjoying school. And, you know, I am so lucky to be a part of a community where I am the assistant superintendent where my kids go to school. And so I get to work with their teachers. And, you know, when I first came to the district, there was only 18 and a half hours of professional development a year, you know, which is which is very little if we're trying to change teacher practice. And over time, by working with our families, by working with our school board, for saying this is why teacher develop, professional development is so important, this is what we want to teach teachers how to do, and this is how we're going to do it, we were actually able to, and this was 100% on our school board for being amazing advocates for all the parents in our community, is um, they actually went and changed the school calendar, and our teachers now get 78 and a half hours a year. So there's a half day every other Friday so we can allow our teachers to be learners, and that has allowed us to change the district. And what's really amazing about this is even though we are not in any way responsive to standardized testing, meaning that we do not endorse preparing for standardized tests, you know, we don't require that from teachers. Um, our scores year after year after year have gone up so significantly um, because our kids are, are thinkers. And when they're thinkers and they're learners and you put them in front of any measure at all, you know, they're going to say, okay, I know myself pretty well. This is how I'm going to try to do it. And I'm going to do the best that I can. And, you know, let's, let's see what I got. And, a, a student who is a learner, who is purposeful and motivated and, and resourceful and strategic, is going to do better than any student ever who sits with packets and practice tests for an entire year, um, because not only do they not know how to learn, is, is they don't know how to think. And, you know, we're preparing them with old tests. And the, and the funny thing is, is, we don't know what the new test is going to look like. So I mean, we, we have no idea what <laughs> we're even preparing for. So, like, you know, uh, John Mundorf, who is this amazing EDL educator, he's a professor in the University of Florida, he always says, you know, if given the opportunity, I will always teach in a very accessible way for an inaccessible test than to teach in an inaccessible way for an inaccessible test. You know, and, and that test is not our maker. And, you know, right now we serve children. We do not serve a test. And the best way that we can serve our kids 
is, again, to inspire them and teach them how to learn and to get them to be engaged into what does it mean to use information in a way that allows you to meet your goals. And and that right there, like that's like going back to Socrates and Plato, like that is the purpose of knowledge and thinking is because it's a beautiful, beautiful journey that will lead you to a place that no one else has ever been. Mm. Well, and, and you're so preparing all these children for these life skills that otherwise they wouldn't develop, you know, and it, it, you, you're starting them out early in how to do this. Yeah, and, and admit it, imagine, though, if you could have started out early. Like when you think back to the best parts in your school, it's going to be like these projects here or there. You know, what do you really remember about your 12 years? It was never lectures. It was never, you know, a, a book. <laughs> it's like the opportunity to collaborate and create something. And every day is an opportunity for us to create these new experiences. And so, you know, I think that the the biggest reason why, you know, I wanted to dive into this concept of let them thrive is because as a parent, I am like fired up and excited about this change. And so few people know about this change because it really kind of runs in the education community, like just how I'm not super aware of, you know, new um, coding procedures in computer science you know, because no one has ever told me why it's important for me, you know, it's this, you know, what if there is a way to get more parents to understand why this is important and what it looks like and then how to begin to advocate for it, you know, how to begin to bring up at school board meetings and with teachers and by having book clubs and saying to friends like, hey, you know, what does your kid's schooling look like? You know, I don't think it's supposed to look like that anymore. And if we across this country could start having those conversations, you know, I think that parents could actually change education a lot faster than it would ever change from the inside out. Mm. You really know your stuff, Katie. If there's a school district that would like to bring you out to, you know, teach their teachers, go through a, a, a talk or something along that line, how could they get in touch with you to do that? Well, my I have a website. It's katienovakudl.com. Um, and I actually am still very, very lucky and blessed to be working almost full time in a school district. So I actually work as a point eight assistant superintendent. Um, so my availability is not, you know, it, it could never um, meet all the needs of these amazing schools in the whole country. Um, so the 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 great news is, is there's an amazing organization also that I would be happy to endorse and connect you with, um, which is called the Center for Applied Special Technology, and they are actually the founders of Universal Design for Learning, and, and there is a much bigger reach and a much bigger team there. Um, but also, I have some amazing, amazing colleagues who would fit any possible scenario that you would have. So, you know, whether you're looking to share this with administrators or parent groups or school committees or elementary school or college, um, definitely reach out to me. Again, it's katienovakudl.com, and I can definitely connect you to a perfect person for you and your organization. Um, I can also let you know some amazing schools who are doing this really well because some people's first question is, well, I want to see a school who's doing this. You know, like, is this is this really possible? Is this, you know, this UDL learning topia, is it possible? Um, and so, you know, any question you have, I would be happy, happy to, to reach out and to have a conversation. Um, you know, just as, you know, UDL provides options, there are many options to connect with me. Um, if you go to my website or, you know, you go to my email, I'd be happy to, you know, to give you a call. We can text. We can email. I can Google Hangout. You know, it, it's, I'm available in a lot of different ways. I mean, I'll send a carrier pigeon if I need to. But this, this work is so <laughs> important. And I'm really, really passionate about scaling it. And there's there's a other there's a group of people who also write about UDL who are amazing educators, and they're really prepared to share this as well. And so, you know, just knowing that there are literally options for any parent or any school or any teacher to learn about this, um, and I would be so happy to to start that journey with anyone. Well, and also they can pick up your book, Let Them Thrive. And that's available um, on your website and all major retailers, correct? That is correct. How exciting. Well, you know, Katie, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today and to share your wealth of information. We could tell you're passionate about this. My goodness, you're getting us all fired up. And uh, I know everyone <laughs> wants to go pick up their, their own copy of Let Them Thrive. But, you know, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. 
No, it has been my pleasure. And, and again, you go enjoy your, your greatest journey. And, and again, for anyone who's listening, you know, the next time that, you know, your, your kids give you any trouble, always step back and think, why is this important that they do it? <laughs> what do they need to know? <laughs> and are there any other ways about how they could show me what they know? And really, that is like the magic way to, to tap into the brain of any of our wonderful little birds that we have. Well, thank you, Katie. It's been such a pleasure to spend this time with you and, of course, to talk with you about your new book, Let Them Thrive. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.